Chapter 9. I have the worst family reunion ever. Annabeth volunteered to go alone, since she had the cap of invisibility, but I convinced her it was too dangerous. Either we all went together or nobody went. Nobody, Tyson voted. Please? But in the end he came along, nervously chewing on his huge fingernails. We stopped at our cabin long enough to gather our stuff. We figured whatever happened, we would not be staying another night aboard the zombie cruise ship, even if they did have million dollar bingo. I made sure Riptide was in my pocket and the vitamins and flask from Hermes were at the top of my bag. I didn't want Tyson to carry everything, but he insisted, and Annabeth told me not to worry about it. Tyson could carry three full duffel bags over his shoulder as easily as I could carry a backpack. We sneaked through the corridors, following the ship's You Are Here signs towards the Admiralty Suite. Annabeth scouted ahead invisibly. We hid whenever someone passed by, but most of the people we saw were just glassy-eyed zombie passengers. As we came up the stairs to Deck 13, where the Admiral Admiralty Suite was supposed to be, Annabeth hissed, Hide! and shoved us into a supply closet. I heard a couple of guys coming down the hall. You see that Ethiopian dracon in the cargo hold, one of them said. The other laughed, Yeah, it's awesome! Annabeth was still invisible, but she squeezed my arm hard. I got a feeling I should know that second guy's voice. I hear they got two more coming, the familiar voice said. They keep arriving at this rate. Oh man, no contest. The voices faded down the corridor. That was Chris Rodriguez. Annabeth took off her cap and turned visible. You remember, from Cabin 11. I sort of recalled Chris from the summer before. He was one of those undetermined campers who got stuck in the Hermes camp in the cabin because his Olympian dad or mum never claimed him. Now that I thought about it, I realised I hadn't seen Chris at camp this summer. What's another half-blood doing here? Annabeth shook her head, clearly troubled. We kept going down the corridor. I didn't need maps and more to know I was getting close to Luke. I sensed something cold and unpleasant, the presence of evil. Percy, Annabeth stopped suddenly. Look. She stood in front of a glass wall, looking down into the multi-storey canyon that ran through the middle of the ship. At the bottom was the promenade, a mouth full of shops, but that's not what had caught Annabeth's attention. A group of monsters had assembled in front of the candy store, a dozen Lystragonian giants like the ones who'd attacked me with dodgeballs, two hellhounds, and a few even stranger creatures, humanoid females with twin serpent tails instead of legs. Scythian Draconi, Annabeth whispered. Dragon women. The monsters made a semicircle around a young guy in Greek armour who was hacking on a straw dummy. A lump formed in my throat when I realised the dummy was wearing an orange camp half-blood t-shirt. As we watched, the guy in armour stabbed the dummy through its belly and ripped upwards. Straw flew everywhere. The monsters cheered and howled. Annabeth stepped away from the window. Her face was ashen. Come on, I told her, trying to sound braver than I felt. The sooner we find Luke, the better. At the end of the hallway were double oak doors that looked like they must lead somewhere important. When we were ten metres away, Tyson stopped. Voices inside! You can hear that far, I asked. Tyson closed his eye like he was concentrating hard. Then his voice changed, becoming a husky approximation of Luke's. The prophecy, ourselves. The fools won't know which way to run. Before I could react, Tyson's voice changed again, becoming deeper and gruffer, like the other guy we'd heard talking to Luke outside the cafeteria. You really think the old horseman is gone for good? Tyson looked and laughed at Luke's laugh. They can't trust him, not with the skeletons in his closet. The po poisoning of the tree was the final straw. Annabeth shivered. Stop that, Tyson. How do you do that? It's creepy. Tyson opened his eye and looked puzzled. Just listening. Keep going, I said. What else are they saying? Tyson closed his eye again. He hissed in the gruff man's voice. Quiet. Then Luke's voice, whispering, Are you sure? Yes, Tyson said in a gruff voice. Right outside. Too late. I realised what was happening. I just had time to say, Run! When the doors of the stateroom burst open and there was Luke, flanked by two hairy giants armed with javelins, their bronze tips aimed right at our chests. Well, Luke said with a crooked smile, if it isn't my two favourite cousins, come right in. The stateroom was beautiful and it was horrible. The beautiful part, huge windows curved along the back wall, looked out over the stern of the ship. Green sea and blue sky stretched all the way to the horizon. A Persian rug covered the floor. Two plush sofas occupied the middle of the room, with a canopied bed in one corner and a mahogany dining table in the other. The table was loaded with food, pizza boxes, bottles of soda and a stack of roast beef sandwiches on a silver platter. The horrible part, on a velvet dace at the back of the room lay a three metre long golden casket. 
a sarcophagus engraved with ancient Greek scenes of cities in flames and heroes dying grisly deaths. Despite the sunlit sunlight streaming through the windows, the casket made the whole room feel cold. Well, Luke said, spreading his arms proudly, a little nicer than cabin 11, huh? He'd changed since last summer. Instead of Bermuda shorts and a t-shirt, he wore a button-down shirt, khaki trousers and leather loafers. His sandy hair, which used to be so unruly, was now clipped short. He looked like an evil male model, showing off what the fashionable college-age villain was wearing to Harvard this year. He still had the scar under his eye, a jagged white line from his battle with a dragon, and propped against the sofa was his magical sword, Backbiter, glinting strangely with its half-steel, half-celestial bronze blade that could kill both mortals and monsters. Sit, he told us. He waved his hand, and three dining chairs scooted themselves into the centre of the room. None of us sat. Luke's large friends were still pointing their javelins at us. They looked like twins, but they weren't human. They stood about two and a half metres tall, for one thing, and wore only blue jeans, probably because their enormous chests were already shag-carpeted with thick brown fur. They had claws for fingernails, feet like paws. Their noses were snout-like and their teeth were all pointed canines. "'Where are my manners?' Luke said smoothly. "'These are my assistants, Agrius and Arias. Perhaps you've heard of them.' I said nothing. Despite the javelins pointed at me, it wasn't the bear twins who scared me. I'd imagined meeting Luke again many times since he tried to kill me last summer. I'd pictured myself boldly standing up to him, challenging him to a duel. But now that we were face to face, I could barely stop my hands from shaking. "'You don't know Agrius and Areus's story?' Luke asked. "'Their mother. <laughs> well, it's sad, really. Aphrodite ordered the young woman to fall in love. She refused and ran to Artemis for help. Artemis let her become one of her maiden huntresses, but Aphrodite got her revenge.' She bewitched the young woman into falling in love with a bear. When Artemis found out, she abandoned the girl in disgust. Typical of the gods, wouldn't you say? They fight with one another and the poor humans get caught in the middle. The girl's tw twin sons here, Agrius and Areus, have no love for Olympus. They like half-bloods well enough, though. For lunch, Agrius growled. His gruff voice was the one I'd heard talking with Luke earlier. <laughs> his brother, Areus, laughed, licking his fur-lined lips. He kept laughing like he was having an asthmatic fit un until Luke and Agrius both stared at him. Shut up, you idiot, Agrius growled. Go punish yourself. Areus whimpered. He trudged over to the corner of the room, slumped into a s onto a stool and banged his forehead against the dining table, making the silver plates rattle. Luke acted like this was perfectly normal behaviour. He made himself comfortable on the sofa and propped his feet up on the coffee table. Well, Percy, we let you survive another year. I hope you appreciated it. How's your mum? How's school? You poisoned Thalia's tree. Luke sighed. Ah, right to the point, eh? Okay, sure, I poisoned the tree. So what? How could you? Annabeth sounded so angry I thought she'd explode. Thalia saved your life, our lives. How could you dishonour her? I didn't dishonour her, Luke snapped. The gods dishonoured her. Annabeth, if Thalia were alive, she'd be on my side. Liar. If you knew what was coming, you'd understand. I understand you want to destroy the camp she yelled. You're a monster. She shook his head. Luke shook his head. The gods have blinded you. Can't you imagine a world without the Manabeth? What good is that ancient history you study? Three thousand years of baggage. The West is rotten to the core. It has to be destroyed. Join me. We can start the world anew. We could use your intelligence, Annabeth, because you have none of your own. His eyes narrowed. I know you, Annabeth. You deserve better than tagging along on some hopeless quest to save the camp. Half-Blood Hill will be overrun by monsters within the month. The heroes will survive. <laughs> the, the, the heroes who survive will have no choice but to join us or be hunted to extinction. You really want to be on a losing team with company like this? Luke pointed at Tyson. Hey, I said, travelling with a cyclops, Luke chided. Talk about dishonouring Thalia's memory. I'm surprised at you, Annabeth. You of all people. Stop it, she shouted. I didn't know what Luke was talking about, but Annabeth buried her head in her hands like she was about to cry. Leave her alone, I said, and leave Tyson out of this. Luke laughed. <laughs> oh yeah, I heard. Your father claimed him. I must have looked surprised because Luke smiled. Yes, Percy, I know all about that and about your plan to find the fleece. What were those coordinates again? 30, 31, 75, 12. You see, I still have friends at camp who keep me posted. Spies, you mean? He shrugged. How many insults from your father can you stand, Percy? You think he's grateful for it to you? You think Poseidon cares for you any more than he cares for this monster? 
Tyson clenched his fists and made a rumbling sound down in his throat. Luke just chuckled. The gods are so using you, Percy. Do you have any idea what's in store for you if you reach your 16th birthday? Has Kyron even told you the prophecy? I wanted to get in Luke's face and tell him off, but as usual, he knew just how to throw me off balance. 16th birthday. I mean, I knew Kyron had received a prophecy from the Oracle many years ago. I knew part of it was about me, but if I reached my 16th birthday, I didn't like the sound of that. I know what I need to know, I managed, like who my enemies are. Then you're a fool. Tyson smashed the nearest dining chair to splinters. Percy is not a fool. Before I could stop him, he charged Luke. His fist came down towards Luke's head, a double overhead blow that would have knocked a hole in a tight in titanium. But the bear twins intercepted. They each caught one of Tyson's arms and stopped him cold. They pushed him back and Tyson stumbled. He fell to the carpet so hard the deck shook. Two bad cyclops, Luke said. Looks like my grisly friends together are more than a match for your strength. Maybe I should let them. Luke, I cut in. Listen to me. Your father sent us. His face turned the colour of pepperoni. Don't even mention him. He told us to take his, this boat. I, I thought it was just for a ride, but he sent us here to find you. He told me he won't give up on you, no matter how angry you are. Angry, Luke roared. Give up on me. He abandoned me, Percy. I want Olympus destroyed. Every throne crushed to rubble. You tell Hermes it's going to happen too. Each time a half-blood joins us, the Olympians grow weaker and we grow stronger. He grows stronger. Luke pointed to the gold sarcophagus. The box creeped me out, but I was determined not to show it. So, I demanded, what's so special? Then it hit me. What might be inside the sarcophagus? The temperature in the room seemed to drop 20 degrees. Whoa, you don't mean... He is reforming, Luke said. Little by little, we're calling his life force out of the pit. With every recruit who pledges our cause, another small piece appears. That's disgusting, Annabeth said. Luke sneered at her. Your mother was born from Zeus's split skull, Annabeth. I wouldn't talk. <laughs> Soon there will be enough of the Titan Lord so that we can make him whole again. We will piece together a new body for him, a work worthy of the forges of Hephaestus. You're insane, Annabeth said. Join us and you'll be rewarded. We have powerful friends, sponsors rich enough to buy this cruise ship and much more. Percy, your mother will never have to work again. You can buy her a mansion. You can have power, fame, whatever you want. Annabeth, you can realise your dream of being an architect. You can build a monument to last a thousand years, a temple to the lords of the next age. Go to Tartarus, she said. Luke sighed. <sighs> a shame. He picked up something that looked like a TV remote and pressed a red button. Within seconds, the door of the stateroom opened and two uniformed crew members came in armed with nightsticks. They had the same glossy-eyed look as the other mortals I'd seen, but I had a feeling this wouldn't make them any less dangerous in a fight. Ah, good. Security, Luke said. I'm afraid we have some stowaways. Yes, sir, they said dreamily. Luke turned to Arias. It's time to feed the Ethiopian Dracon. <laughs> Take these fools below and show them how it's done. Arias grinned stupidly. <laughs> Let me go too, Agrius grumbled. My brother is worthless. That Cyclops is no threat, Luke said. He glanced back at the golden casket as if something was troubling him. Agrius, stay here. We have important matters to discuss. But, Arias, don't fail me. Stay on in the hold to make sure the Dracon is properly fed. Arias prodded us with his javelin and herded us out of the state room, followed by the two human security guards. As I walked down the corridor with Arias's javelin poking me in the back, I thought about what Luke had said, that the bear twins together were a match for Tyson's strength, but maybe separately. We exited the corridor amidships and walked across an open deck lined with lifeboats. I knew the ship well enough to realise this would be our last look at sunlight. Once we got to the other side, we'd take the elevator down into the hold and that would be it. I looked at Tyson and said, now. Thank the gods he understood. He turned and smacked Arias ten metres backwards into the swimming pool, right into the middle of the zombie tourist family. Ah! The kids yelled in unison, We are not having a blast in the pool! One of the security guards drew his nightstick, but Annabeth knocked the wind out of him with a well-placed kick. The other guard ran for the nearest alarm box. Stop him! Annabeth yelled, but it was too late. Just before I banged him on the head with a deck chair, he hit the alarm. Red lights flashed. Sirens wailed. Lifeboat! I yelled. 
We ran for the nearest one. By the time we got the cover off, monsters and more security men were swarming the deck, pushing aside tourists and waiters with trays of tropical drinks. A guy in Greek armour drew his sword and charged, but slipped in a puddle of pina colada. Lestrogonian archers assembled on the deck above us, notching arrows in their enormous bows. How do you launch this thing? screamed Annabeth. A hellhound leapt at me, but Tyson slammed it aside with a fire extinguisher. Get in, I yelled. I uncapped Riptide and slashed the first volley of arrows out of the air. Any second, we would be overwhelmed. The lifeboat was hanging over the side of the ship, high above the water. Annabeth and Tyson were having no luck with the release pulley. I jumped in beside them. Hold on, I yelled, and I cut the ropes. A shower of arrows whistled over our heads as we free fell towards the ocean. Chapter 10. We hitch a ride with dead confederates. Flask! I screamed as we hurtled towards the water. What? Annabeth must have thought I'd lost my mind. She was holding on to the boat straps for dear life, her hair flying straight up like a torch. But Tyson understood. He managed to open my duffel bag and take out Hermes's magical flask without losing his grip on it or the boat. Arrows and javelins whistled past us. I grabbed the flask and hoped I was doing the right thing. Hang on! I am hanging on! Annabeth yelled. Tighter! I hooked my feet under the boat's inflatable bench, and as Tyson grabbed Annabeth and me by the backs of our shirts, I gave the flask cap a quarter turn. Instantly, a white sheet of wind jetted out of the flask and propelled us sideways, turning our downward plummet into a 45-degree crash landing. The wind seemed to laugh as it shot from the flask, like it was glad to be free. As we hit the ocean, we bumped once, twice, skipping like a stone, and then we were whizzing along like a speedboat, salt spray in our faces and nothing but sea ahead. I heard a wail of outrage from the ship behind us, but we were already out of weapon range. The Princess Andromeda faded to the size of a white toy boat in the distance, and then it was gone. As we raced over the sea, Annabeth and I tried to send an iris message to Chiron. We figured it was important we let somebody know what Luke was doing, and we didn't know who else to trust. The wind from the flask stirred up a nice sea spray that made a rainbow in the sunlight, perfect for an iris message, but our connection was still poor. When Annabeth threw a gold drachma into the mist and prayed for the rainbow goddess to show us Chiron, his face appeared all right, but there was some kind of weird strobe light -like flashing in the background and rock music blaring, like he was at a dance club. We told him about sneaking away from camp and Luke and the Princess Andromeda and the golden box for Cronus's remains, but between the noise on his end and the rushing wind and water on our end, I'm not sure how much he heard. Percy, Chiron yelled, you have to watch out for... His voice was drowned out by loud shouting behind him, a bunch of voices whooping it up like Comanche warriors. What? I yelled. Curse my relatives! Chiron ducked as a plate flew over his head and shattered somewhere out of sight. Annabeth, you shouldn't have let Percy leave camp, but if you do get the fleece... Yeah, baby! Somebody behind Chiron yelled. Woohoo! The music got cranked up. Subwoofers so loud it made our boat vibrate. Miami! Chiron was yelling. I'll try to keep watch! Our misty screen smashed apart like someone on the other side had thrown a bottle at it, and Chiron was gone. An hour later, we spotted land, a long stretch of beach lined with high-rise hotels. The water became crowded with fishing boats and tankers. A Coast Guard cruiser passed on to our star starboard side, and then turned like it wanted a second look. I guess it isn't every day they see a yellow lifeboat with no engine going a hundred knots an hour, manned by three kids. That's Virginia Beach, Annabeth said as we approached the shoreline. Oh my gods, how did the Princess Andromeda travel so far overnight? That's like 530 nautical miles, I said. She stared at me. How did you know that? I, I'm not sure. Annabeth thought for a moment. Percy, what's our position? 36 degrees, 44 minutes north, 76 degrees, 2 minutes west, I said immediately. And then I shook my head. <laughs> Whoa, how did I know that? Because of your dad, Annabeth guessed. When you're at sea, you have perfect bearings. That is so cool. I wasn't sure about that. I didn't want to be a human GPS unit. But before I could say anything, Tyson snapped, st tapped my shoulder. Other boat is coming! I looked back. The Coast Guard vessel was definitely on our tail now. Its lights were flashing, and it was gaining speed. We can't let them catch us, I said. They'll ask too many questions. Keep going into Chesapeake Bay, Annabeth said. I know a place we can hide. I didn't ask what she meant or how she knew the area so well. I risked loosening the flask cap a little more, and a fresh burst of wind sent us rocketing around the northern tip of Virginia Beach into Chesapeake Bay. 
the Coast Guard boat fell further and further behind. We didn't slow down until the shores of the bay narrowed on either side and I realised we'd entered the mouth of a river. I could feel the change from salt water to fresh water. Suddenly I was tired and frazzled, like I was coming down off a sugar high. I didn't know where I was anymore or which way to steer the boat. It was a good thing Annabeth was directing me. There, she said, past the sandbar. We veered into a swampy area choked with marsh grass. I beached the lifeboat at the foot of a giant cypress. Vine-covered trees loomed above us. Insects churred in the woods. The air was muggy and hot, and steam curled off the river. Basically, it wasn't Manhattan, and I didn't like it. Come on, Annabeth said. It's just down the bank. What is, I asked. Just follow. She grabbed a duffel bag, and we'd better cover the boat. We don't want to draw attention. After burying the lifeboat with branches, Tyson and I followed Annabeth along the shore, our feet sinking in red mud. A snake slivered past my shoe and disappeared into the grass. Not a good place, Tyson said. He swatted the mosquitoes that were forming a buffet queue on his arm. After another few minutes, Annabeth said, Here. All I saw was a patch of brambles, and then Annabeth moved aside a woven circle of branches like a door, and I realised I was looking into a camouflage shelter. The inside was big enough for three, even with Tyson being the third. The walls were woven from plant material, like a Native American hut, but they looked pretty waterproof. Stacked in the corner was everything you could want for a campout. Sleeping bags, blankets, an ice chest, and a kerosene lamp. There were demigod provisions too. Bronze javelin tips, a quiver full of arrows, an extra sword, and a box of ambrosia. The place smelled musty, like it had been vacant for a long time. A half-blood hideout! I looked at Annabeth in awe. You made this place? Thalia and I, she said quietly. Uh, and Luke. That shouldn't have bothered me. I mean, I knew Thalia and Luke had taken care of Annabeth when she was little. I knew the, tree, the three of them had been runaways together, hiding from monsters, surviving on their own before Grover found them and tried to get them to Half-Blood Hill. But whenever Annabeth talked about the time she'd spent with them, I kind of felt, I don't know, uncomfortable. No, that's not the word. The word was jealous. So, I said, you don't think Luke will look for us here? She shook her head. We made a dozen safe houses like this. I doubt Luke even remembers where they are, or cares. She threw herself down on the blankets and started going through her duffel bag. Her body language made it pretty clear she didn't want to talk. Um, Tyson, I said, would you mind scouting around outside? Like, look for a wilderness convenience store or something. Convenience store? Yeah, for snacks. Powdered donuts or something. Just don't go too far. Powdered donuts, Tyson said earnestly. I will look for powdered donuts in the wilderness. He headed outside and started calling, Here, donuts! Once he was gone, I sat down across from Annabeth. Hey, I'm sorry about, you know, seeing Luke. It's not your fault. She unsheathed her knife and started cleaning the blade with a rag. He let us go too easily, I said. I hoped I'd been imagining it, imagining it but Annabeth nodded. I was thinking the same thing. What we overheard him say about a gamble, and they'll take the bait. I think he was talking about us. The fleece is the bait, or, or Grover? She studied the edge of her knife. I don't know, Percy. Maybe he wants the fleece for himself. Maybe he's hoping we'll do the hard work and then he can steal it from us. I just can't believe he would poison the tree. What did he mean? I asked. That Thalia would have been on his side. He's wrong. You don't sound sure. Annabeth glared at me, and I started to wish I hadn't asked her about this while she was holding a knife. Percy, you know who you remind me of most? Thalia. You guys are so much alike it's scary. I mean, either you would have been best friends or you would have strangled each other. Let's go with best friends. Thalia got angry with her dad sometimes. So do you. Would you turn against Olympus because of that? I stared at the quiver of arrows in the corner. No? Okay then, neither would she. Luke's wrong. Annabeth stuck her knife blade into the dirt. I wanted to ask her about the prophecy Luke had mentioned and what it had to do with my 16th birthday, but I figured she wouldn't tell me. Chiron had made it pretty clear that I wasn't allowed to hear it until the gods decided otherwise. So, what did Luke mean about Cyclopses? I asked. He said, you of all people. I know what he said. He, he was talking about the real reason Thalia died. I waited, not sure what to say. Annabeth drew a shaky breath. You can never trust a Cyclops, Percy. Six years ago, on the night Grover was leading us to Half-Blood Hill. She was interrupted when the door of the hut creaked open and Tyson crawled in. Powdered doughnuts, he said proudly, holding up a pastry box. Annabeth stared at him. Where did you get that? We're in the middle of the wilderness. There's nothing around for... Fifteen metres, Tyson said. 
Monster donut shop, just over the hill. This is bad, Annabeth muttered. We were crouching behind a tree, staring at the donut shop in the middle of the woods. It looked brand new, with brightly lit windows, a parking area and a little road leading off into the forest. But there was nothing else around and no cars parked in the lot. We could see one employee reading a magazine behind the cash register. That was it, on the store's awning in huge black letters. There even, I could see, it read, Monster Donut. A cartoon ogre was taking a bite out of the O in Monster. The place smelled good like fresh baked chocolate donuts. This shouldn't be here, Annabeth whispered. It's wrong. What? I asked. It's a donut shop. Shh. Why are you whispering? Tyson went in and bought a dozen. Nothing happened to him. He's a monster. Oh, come on, Annabeth. Monster donut doesn't mean monsters. It's a chain. We've got them in New York. A chain, she agreed. And don't you think it's strange that one appeared immediately after you told Tyson to get donuts right here in the middle of the woods? I thought about it. It did seem a little weird. But I mean, donut shops weren't real high on my list of sinister forces. It could be a nest, Annabeth explained. Tyson whimpered. I doubt he understood what Annabeth was saying any better than I did, but her tone was making him nervous. He ploughed through half a dozen donuts from his box and was getting powdered sugar all over his face. A nest for what? I asked. Haven't you ever wondered how franchise stores pop up so fast? She asked. One day there's nothing and then the next day, boom, there's a new burger place or a coffee shop or whatever. First a single store, then two, then four, exact replicas spreading across the country. Um, no, never thought about it. Percy, some of the chains multiply so fast because all their locations are magically linked to the life force of a monster. Some children of Hermes figured out how to do it back in the 1950s. They breed. She froze. What? I demanded. They breed what? No, no sudden moves, Annabeth said, like her life depended on it. Very slowly, turn around. And then I heard it, a scraping noise, like something large dragging its belly through the leaves. I turned and saw a rhino-sized thing moving through the shadows of the trees. It was hissing, its front half writhing in all different directions. I couldn't understand what I was seeing at first, and then I realised the thing had multiple necks, at least seven, each topped with a hissing reptilian head. Its skin was leathery, and under each neck it wore a plastic bib that read, I'm a monster donut kid. I took out my ballpoint pen, but Annabeth locked eyes with me, a silent warning. Not yet. I understood. A lot of monsters have terrible eyesight. It was possible that Hydra might pass by. But if I uncapped my sword now, the bronze glow would certainly get its attention. We waited. The Hydra was only a metre or so away. It seemed to be sniffing the ground and the trees like it was hunting for something. And then I noticed that two of the heads were ripping apart a piece of yellow canvas. One of our duffel bags. The thing had already been to our campsite. It was following our scent. My heart pounded. I'd seen a stuffed Hydra head trophy at camp before, but that did nothing to prepare me for the real thing. Each head was diamond-shaped, like a rattlesnake's, but the mouths were lined with jagged rows of shark-like teeth. Tyson was trembling. He stepped back and accidentally snapped a twig. Immediately, all seven heads turned towards us and hissed. Scatter! Annabeth yelled. She dived to the right. I rolled to the left. One of the Hydra heads spat an arc of green liquid that shot past my shoulder and splashed against an elm. The trunk smoked and began to disintegrate. The whole tree toppled straight towards Tyson, who still hadn't moved, petrified by the monster that was now right in front of him. Tyson! I tackled him with all my might, knocking him aside, just as the Hydra lunged and the tree crashed on top of two of its heads. The Hydra stumbled backwards, yanking its heads free and wailing in outrage at the fallen tree. All seven heads shot acid, and the elm melted into a steaming pool of muck. Move, I told Tyson. I ran to one side and uncapped Riptide, hoping to draw the monster's attention. It worked. The sight of celestial bronze is hateful to most monsters. As soon as my glowing blade appeared, the Hydra whipped towards it with all its heads, hissing and baring its teeth. The good news, Tyson was momentarily out of danger. The bad news, I was about to be melted into a puddle of goo. One of the heads snapped at me experimentally. Without thinking, I swung my sword. No! Annabeth yelled. Too late. I sliced the Hydra's head clean off. It rolled away into the grass, leaving a flailing stump, which immediately stopped bleeding and began to swell like a balloon. In a matter of seconds, the wounded neck split into two necks, each of which grew a full-size head. Now I was looking at an eight-headed Hydra. Percy! Annabeth scolded. You just opened another monster donut shop, donut shop somewhere. I dodged a spray of acid. I'm about to die and you're worried about that? 
How do we kill it? Fire, Annabeth said. We have to have fire. As soon as she said that, I remembered the story. The Hydra's heads would only stop multiplying if we burned the stumps before they regrew. That's what Heracles had done anyway, but we had no fire. I backed up towards the river. The Hydra followed. Annabeth moved in on my left and tried to distract one of the heads, parrying its teeth with her knife. But another head swung sideways like a club and knocked her into the muck. No hitting my friends! Tyson charged in, putting himself between the Hydra and Annabeth. As Annabeth got to her feet, Tyson started smashing at the monster heads with his fists, so fast it reminded me of the whack-a-mole game at the arcade. But even Tyson couldn't fend off the Hydra forever. We kept inching backwards, dodging ash acid splashes and deflecting snapping heads without cutting them off. But I knew we were only postponing our deaths. Eventually we would make a mistake and the thing would kill us. Then I heard a strange sound, a chug, 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 that at first I thought was my heartbeat. It was so powerful it made the riverbank shake. What's that noise? Annabeth shouted, keeping her eyes on the Hydra. Steam engine, Tyson said. What? I ducked as the Hydra spat acid over my head. And then, from the river behind us, a familiar female voice shouted, There! Prepare the 32-pounder! I didn't dare look away from the Hydra, but if that was who I thought it was behind us, I figured we now had enemies on two fronts. A gravelly male voice said, They're too close, my lady. Damn the heroes, the girl said. Full steam ahead! I'm a lady. Fire at will, Captain! Annabeth understood what was happening a split second before I did. She yelled, Hit the dirt! and we dived for the ground as an earth-shattering boom echoed from the river. There was a flash of light, a column of smoke, and the hydra exploded right in front of us, showering us with nasty green slime that vaporised as soon as it hit, the way monster guts tend to do. Gross! screamed Annabeth. Steamship! yelled Tyson. I stood coughing from the cloud of gunpowder smoke that was rolling across the banks. Chugging towards us, down the river, was the strangest, strangest ship I'd ever seen. It rode low in the water like a submarine, its deck plated with iron. In the middle was a trapezoid-shaped casemate with slats on each side of cannons. A flag waved from the top, a wild boar and spear on a blood-red field. Lining the deck were zombies in grey uniforms, dead soldiers with shimmering faces that only partially covered their skulls, like the ghouls I'd seen in the underworld guarding Hades' palace. The ship was an ironclad, a Civil War battlecruiser, I could just make out the name along the prow in moss-covered letters, CSS Birmingham, and standing next to the smoking cannon that had almost killed us wearing full Greek battle armour was Clarice. Losers, she sneered, but I suppose I have to rescue you. Come aboard!